The best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their best ball mania tournament has $10 million in total prize money. And the best part is you just draft your fantasy football team and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you the best score each week of the season and the highest scores at the end of the year. The champion of Best Ball Mania last year drafted in June, so there's no time like the present to join Underdog and take a shot at a million-dollar draft. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with promo code PFF. Also, if you play 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to underdogfantasy.com or the App Store, play $10 with code PFF, and draft your Best Ball Mania team today. Alrighty, the Wednesday edition, interview edition of the podcast. I have a very special guest here, although all my guests are special, but uh, a very special guest here, someone I've been interacting with on the Twitter streets for, for a handful of years now. Uh, he is Ron Yurko, a little background on Ron before we get into everything here. He is a soon-to-be assistant teaching professor at Carnegie Mellon Department of Statistics and Data Science. He co-hosts the Open Source Podcast, which discusses the latest research in sports analytics. And he has previously worked for the Pittsburgh Pirates and Zealous Analytics. You can follow him on Twitter at stat underscore Ron. First, right off the top, I noticed when I went to Carnegie Mellon, and congratulations on that, by the way. But when, when I went to the Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon website, in the recent announcements, it said changing from the Department of Statistics to the Department of Dis Statistics and Data Science. So do you have a take on this, this, this data science taking over the world? Because for me, like data science seems a little bit more squishy. Like if I were gonna apply to a job and it said data scientist, which is technically my title, I might feel okay about that. If it said statistician, I would think, hmm, I, I don't know if I'm qualified for this, quite honestly. So I think it's, so first, thanks for having me. Yes, love of the, course. Love the pod, um, but I, so, I, my opinion on the data science aspect, I, I've kind of changed over the years on it. Initially, I was kind of uh, grumpy statistician mode, even <laughs> even though I'm like a lot younger than everybody else. Um, but I've come to appreciate the fact of the data wrangling, uh, organizing stages that maybe would fall more under this umbrella of data science, that you need yeah. to have like engineering skills uh, more so than just straight up say being a statistician that might be involved in data collection uh, for a study at the beginning and then doing some analysis. Um, I'd say like data science stage is like the people that are making packages for scraping, accessing data, providing in the means for people to easily access. And uh, so I, I'm good with it. And I, I, I mean, the, yeah, the department, this happened uh, a few years ago, I remember where adding in the and data science and it was a big thing to to use the ampersand instead of just saying and that was actually like a yeah sure, sure there was a, sure there was a handful of committees that that worked <laughs> yeah. on that. the um but you know I, I guess it's what is now considered like okay you're the person more actually like getting into organizing the data that i i respect it now uh, and learning about okay what actual data scientists do in industry now uh, being a little bit more flexible uh, versus, say, pure statistician brought in to consult on a project. Um, yeah, so uh, I I'm good with it now. Okay. If you, you would ask little... me three or four years ago, I would have been like, <laughs> I think it's just a made up term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're coming around. I think it is kind of a made up term, but I, because uh, it's always weird. Like, no one has any idea what you're talking I mean, if, if they're not. It's true. Even, okay. even if you're it, in so data no science, one, you might yeah, not know. So what you're no one about. really has. So I think it's consistent within a company or an organization, right? But yeah. then if you look at what's a data scientist, what's a senior data scientist across organization, you know, it varies greatly. Oh yeah, yeah. Even within an organization, they'll have 
the data scientists who are not really that technical, but they know, you know, SQL and they can start to do some stuff in that area. And they'll have that whole branch. And then they'll have like your branch with the PhDs and others in the same area. And they'll still call yeah. them both data science. So I think there's also kind of a little bit of a marketing job, marketing aspect probably to, to throwing that onto the title too. It's the hot term right now, yes. right? So if you get in the department name, you know, great things happen in terms of recruiting. Hey, and whatnot. Where your salary is coming from? So you got to get on board. You, you, you gotta, you gotta get on board there. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your your background. Uh, I don't know how far back we want to go. We don't, we don't need to go back to you know when you were a little toddler thinking about sports for, for for the first time. But you started to get into some of this stuff as was it was it was it when you were an undergraduate i guess maybe we could go back to that or was it when you were you're going yeah, through your doctorate so, and everything like, else like just like initial background i guess like many people yeah. i read moneyball and i love sports and that was the first time i really started to learn about statistics and that reading that book reading baseball prospectus work that that got me interested into uh, sports analytics so then undergrad i ended up becoming a stats major and i the, the strange opportunity of the Tampa Bay Rays were recruiting from Carnegie Mellon and I applied, went through interview process. I remember it was like James Click, who I'm pretty sure is a general manager now. But at the time he was with the Rays as the. Yeah, as you're, you're asking the wrong guy the, on, on uh, baseball stuff here, but yeah, the, I'll take your word for it. The, but I ended up with this opportunity with the Rays that I could not afford. All right. Just straight off the bat, this was you know, sports opportunities, especially at the time were very low dollar amounts that someone like me, it was, there was no way I could move to Tampa and do this. So I then sent a cold email to the Pittsburgh Pirates, like, Hey, Carnegie Mellon internship opportunity. What do you say? And fortunately they responded and I ended up doing this internship, which basically changed my life in the aspect that I gained respect from people from, Hey, I am actually working for a major league baseball team. Uh, and got me hands-on experience of what the day-to-day -day life was as someone in this baseball operations uh, analytics role. And then fortunately, I met other like-minded people at Carnegie Mellon during that time, uh, one of which was Maxim Horowitz, who started our sports analytics club. And I ended up uh, graduating a bit early while Max, for his senior thesis, was working on this project advised by then at the time of Professor Sam Ventura, who's now some executive VP, whatever role with the Buffalo Sabres, where he was initially interested in gathering football play-by-play -play data for fantasy and, and betting. All right, that was Max's initial interest while he was off studying abroad in London. This led to the development of NFL Scraper with the idea of, okay, let's get organized play-by-play -play data via an R package that people can easily access but how about we actually include expected points and win probability readily available right in the pack, right in the package, right with the data, so everybody can access this? Uh, they then contacted me, and I got involved and really sort of revamped the modeling aspects uh, right before I was entering grad school. And so NFL Scraper became sort of this uh, initial deep dive project that myself, Sam, and Max worked on. Uh, Max eventually then started working the NBA. He's now been with the Atlanta Hawks ever since. Uh, and so I sort of was the lead developer on working with NFL Scraper, writing a paper on, okay, what are these expected points models and uh, win probability models that we're using? How can we use that to evaluate players? We came up with our approach for uh, calculating wins above replacement uh, based on the play-by-play -play data. And eventually, I, you know, that was my initial deep dive. And now, over the past so many years, uh, worked on various other sports analytics projects, greatly motivated by player tracking data now. Uh, so working on stuff related to uh, big datable releases. And eventually, that led to opportunity with uh, Zealous Analytics uh, that I worked on over this past year. Yeah. Okay. So that, okay. that's so, kind of like a high level overview. Yeah. So so you've kind of been on the the public data side, public meaning you were you guys were able to go ahead and, and extract a lot of this for the public to to be able to work on, which has been huge. And then also with the 
tracking data and the, and the newer stuff that we're working there. Just to, to rewind back a second, I mean, I'm thinking back to when I first started to deal with data, uh, football data specifically, there, there wasn't really a great source for, for getting data. Um, there was a company called Armchair Analysis that I used to get data for where they had everything laid out pretty well um, in, in, a, in a bunch of different tables. It was somewhat inexpensive. Uh, I'm not sure the technique that was being used by this gentleman to extract that data, but it may have been something somewhat similar. But what you guys really did was the data is out there. It's public. It's free. It's fairly easy to, to get your hands on. Even if you don't have R, you could go and get the CSVs if you want to afterwards. And you had the additional layer of throwing in the expected points added and the win probability added, which I thought was huge. I mean, what did you think about the state of football data, I guess, pre-NFL scraper? It was, it was, it was, so pretty, I, it was tough out of the streets, out in this football so I, data I think streets. it's because of that added layer of expected points added, win probability added. Because uh, there were... Um, NFL game was like a Python package. I yeah. remember using. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that one was definitely out there. Yeah, it was a that, similar that sort was, of thing. Yeah, yeah, and like as you said, armchair analysis uh, that you know that people purchase data from, but you know it was still, it, it wasn't you know widely known. I mean, you have work done on Football Outsiders, and they had their data, and you know, I mean, obviously there was what Brian Burke uh, worked on like, twenty years ago now, right? Uh, and I think he made data available to people. Uh, that, that was before my time, so I, I don't know for sure. Um, but you know, the added layer of expected points added, win probability added, that led to people like you, Ben Baldwin, and Josh Hermsmeyer that started using it. And then, yeah. so you're responsible. People started for this. finding out about it. I, never <laughs> I don't know if that's like, a good thing. Also, I don't know if it's a good thing. I, but you're responsible I, 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 for this. I, I will admit, like, okay, this is gonna sound really arrogant, but I feel like, in a way, I helped like create Ben Baldwin. <laughs> like, oh my god! Because Blot. I remember the literal blood was he, you awakened. You awakened. <laughs> yeah, I awakened and, him. Yeah. him to destroy the NFL. Because, yeah, because like I remember this this person like sending me messages about the package. I was like, who is this person? It was like yeah. the Twitter handle was like Google something. I don't even know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they started by uh, posting, you know, these articles on when, you know, the, the most impactful plays in Seahawks games. Right. And that really gathered a lot of attention and was, Hey, this is from NFL scraper. These were the top plays based on expected points added win probability added. Uh, and that was, that was huge for the usage of it. All right. It was people that were actively writing with the data from the package and our models, right? The, uh, that, that was something I took a lot of pride. There's a lot of careful thought for what goes into these expected points models versus what goes into the win probability model. And, you know, looking at work that was, was done by Brian Burke, done by Keith Goldner, uh, and seeing, okay, how do we build upon that, uh, and do our own thing that we believe is the most appropriate way of doing this. And that's been the framework still for uh, once Baldwin and crew kind of took over and led to NFL fast uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's still the, effectively the same type of approach for expected points of trying to model uh, the next scoring event taking place. And as long as you have the probabilities uh, well sort of calibrated uh, for these different scoring events that could take place, uh, then you could have an appropriate expected points model to use when thinking about uh, expected points added on a play-to-play -play basis. Because the end goal for everything we wanted to do, and this was something that uh, from Sam really sort of inspired for myself, is all of the work we wanted to be something that is actually about like player evaluation, things teams are interested in. You, know, you could do a lot of work in sports analytics that in some senses – not very interesting from like a team point of view of building you know roster construction so we viewed it as there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in football with regards to how we evaluate players and there still is all right this is a, still a very open-ended question in terms of how we use player tracking data at this level now uh, but what we decided was use these models set up this framework to attempt to try to arrive at something that you see in baseball or basketball uh, for estimating like these player level impacts. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think the biggest, one of the bigger impacts has been, well, number one, I would say, I'm pleasantly surprised by 
buy-in or attention around a lot of stuff that we see out there today. I mean, there's so many people now who are doing research, again, based upon the same framework that you guys initially came up with and growing into what it is now. So many people doing research where they put it out there and it gains a lot of attention, although it's using these somewhat opaque, you know, maybe difficult to understand concepts of expected points added or win probability added. And what you kind of start to learn is that I think the first thing is you can draw people in like Ben would draw people in for the Seahawks by saying, here's your team. Here's a way to think about what's going on with your team. Or here's the quarterback that you like and look how good they look on this on this, on this comparison. And then people start to learn more and more about it. And now one of the biggest things for me is I feel like a lot of the more cutting edge, maybe it's not the right word, the more stat friendly type of media have also bought into this. And you're hearing it, you know, quoted on ESPN from time to time. Not to, we haven't got yeah, Steven no, Smith there yet, like, I don't think. But Kimes, from time to time. right? Like yeah. you, you hear expected points added, uh, what CPOE also gets tossed out around a bunch of times, even there's 10 different ways to calculate that. Uh, you know, the, you still, it, it's definitely, is not the way it was in 2017 when we started this. It's a lot more ingrained in the discussion. So I, I do believe we had a huge impact on that route of, hey, we, we, we started, we got this thing set up, but it didn't actually, it wouldn't have happened without, you know, people like Ben, people like you, people like Josh that were actively then using it and communicating yeah. right people that are yeah. using it in the more front-facing articles that are much more you know easily accessible to more general audiences uh, than something like i'm gonna write as a statistician trying to get publications and an academic you know career <laughs> path you know, it's very different than something that people can in the broader public access and read whether it be for fantasy football purposes or just you know understanding their favorite team yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, again, like there's a, there's a cycle sometimes with the adoption of analytics where if you use it in a way that backs up what people think sometimes or you use it in a way that 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 makes them think a little bit differently, but somewhat backs up what they think, then they start to buy into it. Then they start to learn more about it. And then you can kind of move them out in different directions. And like you said, you had us to to, to dumb it to dumb it down for you. So I guess w what I would say, though, is as someone who also these numbers can be used in lots of different ways. Stats can be presented in a lot of different ways. Some of them is good, some of them not so good. Do you ever look at stuff that's out there and think to yourself, oh man, like now, now we're getting to the point where it's just being maybe used in a way that could let to lead to less understanding in, in a sort of way, or you know, trying to prove a point too hard by 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 manipulating it in a certain way. Does that ever concern you at all? Yeah, I, I guess I, I get a bit concerned about the approaches people take. Um, where they start to just jump in with very complex uh, machine learning type models from the get-go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, XG Boost is a favor to people. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't do this like with the NFL path, Fast Start Package. That's They use XG Boost for modeling expected points win probability. So XG Boost, gradient boosted trees, a very complex, almost black box sort of way of modeling data that can handle a lot of different information and hopefully have great forecasts and predictions. But it's really hard to understand what's actually going on behind the scenes in terms of how, say, you know, the, the yard line or the distance uh, to go to get a first down, how that's impacting like the 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 probability of scoring a touchdown or whatever. Right. You're kind of just saying, I don't actually care about understanding uh, how each of these things relate to my outcome of interest. Uh, but this is the popular hammer everybody uses to, you know, as their tool for modeling purposes. But you have to be careful in the sense of. You don't. You you have to take a step back and think about how you're approaching this, the data you're working with, and you don't want to just dive in with something complex and you're overfitting or whatever, and you're then assuming what you've done is correct without any baselines to compare to. All right, and so I I feel like especially younger people now kind of jump in with like, well, let's use a neural network. Let's use some boosting thing. And they don't just compare to a simple linear model with just a couple terms in it to start, try to capture whatever effect on an outcome they care about, whether it be some completion 
probability model. All right, to just have, let's just base it on air yards or uh, you know, distance from the sideline or whatever variables you can use uh, versus, oh, let's take the most complicated machine learning approach that we've, uh, we've heard about and see what happens. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's no, like my biggest fear right now is people try to jump in overly complicated without starting with more simpler approaches at the beginning and not yeah. recognizing just limitations of the data you're working with. Or you have to recognize, like when you work with play-by-play -play data, there's a lot of information you don't know about what's going on within the play. All right, you're only observing the beginning and the end and things about potentially who's directly involved or, you know, if you're working at PFF, then you have all sorts of other, you know, annotations about what's going on at the play level. Um, but you, I, I remember the uh, when the first big debatable happened and there was this special issue of uh, by Mike Lopez, who really is the person leading the innovations now in the NFL from what he's done with the big data bowl. But the, the change in understanding fourth down decision-making, once we actually had more fine grained precise measurements about ball location, right. And the, and the line of scrimmage versus, okay, how that impacts, which coaches were say making the right decision. Uh, because at the play level, at this discrete level that we have access to uh, via NFL Scraper, NFL Fast Star, you know, we have no difference between one yard away and, say, uh, inches away in a sense, right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think for me, when I see stuff out there, I don't know if I can even articulate it, but you can. I can kind of get a sense of – whether or not things are probably being done done in a right way or what level of confidence I can have. There's some face uh, validity issues. I think that almost anyone, whether you have a stats-based training or not, could probably pick out of certain things. But again, I'm not maybe looking at the technical side as much as you are. So for, from your perspective, when you see something, are you looking more at like what is their approach how are they maybe getting over their skis a little too much in what they're doing? Or do you use things like face validity when you look at what, what people are doing? Because I think what happens is, and you're mentioning, you want to do these things that sound more complicated or cooler or can capture something. Almost you have an incentive to do that to to kind of like market what you're doing in a way to, to hype up what, what you're doing. So there's always, that's always going to be part of what you're trying to do is to take it to this next level by using this new ingenious thing. But it comes with so many more consequences of not being able to properly calibrate what you're, what you're doing. Yeah. The, and the other thing is overconfidence in the results that they're showing of some kind uh, and thinking about, like my biggest concern, I guess, actually, in a lot of sports analytics related work, it's not just football, uh, thinking about how we're evaluating what we're trying to capture. Right. And the eye test has been like the main thing everybody uses. All right. And I'm guilty of this, too. When we wrote us uh, NFL war paper, we did. We basically looked at the standings like, oh, yeah, these QBs at the top make sense. These QBs at the bottom make sense. So, oh, things must be working right. That's a really yeah, shitty yeah. way of trying to evaluate what you're actually doing. All right. Let's be frank. Okay, I, think, is, I, think, right? I think you're it's calling out a 99 I think you're calling out 99 percent of my evaluation. Here, well, it's every, everybody does this, though. Right. Yeah. So. I think that's really a ripe area of thinking about how do we evaluate what we're coming up with in, in these different analysis? How do we look at, and you know, people have done this of whether it be PFF articles or whatnot, where it's, okay, let's look at how this connects to say predicting wins, All right? If we're coming up with some new type of stat and, have, you know, we look at how this how predictive this is of a team's performance later on if we try to forecast the performance based on whatever measures we have about uh, individual player ratings of some kind. Uh, if it's predictive of wins, the ultimate thing that teams care about, uh, then that's a good sign. If it's not, then what is the point of what you're trying to say? And maybe the point is you just care about uh, measuring in hindsight, okay, the value someone had of some kind, all right? And like win probability added kind of falls in that level. Uh, I'll, I'll use again, like baseball as an example, all right? Even though, even though I know you don't like baseball, 
PFF. <laughs> it's not that I don't like it. Gary's on baseball, right? I don't follow <laughs> baseball. I like but, uh, like the I like fantasy football, so fantasy football disputes in baseball. I like fantasy football disputes within baseball. <laughs> but thinking about like the just the the randomness of uh, the opportunities players could have that are like high leverage moments in baseball games, and so that means oh, a player could really have a high win probability added uh, because maybe they showed up in more impactful moments just by chance potentially, right? Or the clutch gene could be the clutch gene. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. so, just, but like thinking about it in that sense, where okay, that could be something that tells you like the actual value provided during that season, but it might not be predictive at all. But it still tells us okay, if we're thinking about who was the most valuable player, and just giving a sense of this is a way of measuring value relative to actually winning games. That's a good way of, say, ranking to determine who should be MVP. But it might not be the best way of saying who's going to be the best quarterback next year, right? And so I think there, there has to be the careful discussion about that, uh, of thinking about how we're actually evaluating uh, the analysis we have. Uh, someone comes up with a new type of metric and, you know, what, what does it tell me? What is it trying to enable me to have greater understanding about? Uh, you know, how, how could teams use it? Yeah. Yeah. No, but actually I'm, I'm going to stick with this kind of little bit of back and forth on the, the usefulness of, of some of this stuff, because, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll go even a bit further. So let, I want to think about some of the football controversies, maybe overstating it, but the nerds versus the football guys in certain areas. I mean, I think the big, some of the bigger ones that are maybe, uh, illustrative to this sort of point is, I don't know, the body blows argument, let's say. So what, what I want to ask you about this is not, you know, which side do you fall on this sort of spectrum of football guys believing it exists, the importance of physicality, the fact that it'll eventually show up in all these different ways, or on the nerd side saying, well, we've looked and we can't find any evidence of this happening, so therefore it doesn't exist. I still think there's maybe a miscommunication on both sides and how that how the, the, it goes back and forth on that. But what do you think about this thing where on the, the, the practitioner side, they're very sure that it is a thing, and then on the, 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 on the nerd side saying, the lack of evidence means this thing does not exist? Yeah, no, that's a great discussion point of like um, having to be careful of when you're just trying to communicate with anybody, whether it be sports or finance, and you're dealing with a banker because they believe this is going to be predictive of this company defaulting on a loan, right? And you're looking at the data and, hey, it doesn't actually look that way, but they're convinced and they want it in their risk scorecard. I'm saying this as an example of what I did for my job. <laughs> All right. The... Um, I, so it, it definitely does rely on a, what you are able to look at, the data you have access to. Uh, so, I mean, there's going to be people that are never convinced by anything. And I think that just has to be accepted. Uh, I do think there could be some work done on the communication side from the nerds, right, uh, of just throwing something completely under the bus uh, versus, hey, we understand. And this is, you know, what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. It, it I mean, I think a lot of this it, is like uh, a function of Twitter, probably generally. I think, tw yeah, Twitter propagates everything to the, the worst. It brings out the worst of everybody. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, the thing like running backs don't matter. All right. It definitely worked as a marketing <laughs> campaign for NFL analytics, Twitter, right? I, I, I can see to that point that it worked. It, it, is it an overly dramatic statement? Absolutely. But it brought to the attention of the people of uh, how little value, you know, running backs actually say contribute on the, on the positional scale, right? Versus just the importance of quarterbacks. Uh, when people still always kind of, you know, brought up running backs as, you know, you got to get the, 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 the cowbell back to lead your team to victory every Sunday. Right. Uh, and so that, that, that campaign has worked, I, I think, right. Um, there's still, you know, dispute of, okay, how far 
how you know, when you use statements like that, are you going too far in a way? Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer for it. I think you have to be careful. And I think, yeah, social media exaggerates it versus like what goes on behind the scenes. You know, I, what, what happens behind the scenes is very different than the disputes on Twitter uh, for the the Twitter sphere folks on the nerd side, the Twitter sphere folks on the, you know, the football man side. Right. And, uh, you know, when those worlds collide, um, it's very different than how teams that are internally just trying to win more games interact with each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's part of it. Even when it comes to running backs don't matter is the running back market basically peaked even within the NFL. This is not Mm -hmm. nerds. This is not in you know 2000 around Adrian Peterson's MVP season like the the contract that he was given his extension that he was given uh as a percentage of the cap i mean it'd been declining for a very very long time against this so i guess this would be another question do you think nerds are fighting too much with the with the media because that's what this yeah, yeah. Backs don't honestly, matter fight is yeah. is more about is more about fighting the media than it is about fighting the NFL cuz the NFL has caught on to it with some exceptions that we could say, yeah, you know, you shouldn't give Derrick Henry that much money, but Derrick Henry's as a percentage of a cap is nowhere close to what Adrian Peterson and others were making in the past. Yeah. My viewpoint is there are, there, there are a lot of great people in the media. All right. But there are also a lot of people in the media that are in the media because they will never work for an NFL team from the viewpoint of the teams are not going to hire them from their understanding of the game. Right. Yeah. And there are definitely people in the media who would love to work for an NFL team, but don't. All right. And there's obvi- there's, uh, and, you know, just to clarify, like, there's obviously great people in the NFL media that have no interest in the day to day struggles of working for an NFL team and losing sleep for you know the rest of their life uh, that love what they do. And they, they're staying in the media and everything. Right. But you definitely have like dinosaurs on the outside that keep saying the same talking points that like. Like personally, I could care less about fourth down discussions now. All right, it is an mm-hmm. old problem. We understand it and everything. Like the what Mike Lopez did with the tracking data, that was an interesting new insight. But the same talking points about whether or not they should go for it, et cetera, I, I don't care anymore <laughs> because it's it's old in a sense, right? I I want to get at okay, what's the new uh, way forward of the new data we're collecting, what new understanding that we can have. Uh, and I do think there's, it's probably exaggerated because of Twitter, right? Of like highlighting when someone says whatever and pointing it out. And, you know, we all do this uh, and we harp on it for whatever reason. And I don't know what actually it does other than bring out the worst in people in these interactions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it gets you, it gets you engagement. It's funny. I, I don't know. You probably have noticed this, where it, it, not even outside of the world of sports, even if it's the world of, you know, pod, politics or commentary in different areas. It's funny when often I've I've had experience where I've listened to someone who I wasn't familiar with on a podcast. And I'll say like, oh, this is a pretty interesting person. And then I'll go to their Twitter feed. I'm like, oh my God, this is a disaster. Like, why are they such an <laughs> asshole on, on, on here all the time versus this kind of well-reasoned person? So I, I think that's definitely part of it. But like you said about fourth downs, I think part of it, the running backs don't matter and the fourth downs is the nerds maybe – is part of their own marketing is like, you're not just moving on to the next thing. You're kind of spiking the ball a little bit too on these things, just to remind people that you were right is also part of the discussion on, on these things too. Yeah. And I, I honestly think the, the way of spiking the ball on is just recognizing what teams are doing. Yeah. You've already won behind the scenes. Look at how running backs are valued. Look at how teams are changing their fourth down decision-making. That's proof enough. What teams yeah. are doing to me, that's that's the evidence that, hey, the, nerd, the nerds have won these arguments. Yeah, except for Sean McVay, who must be called a boomer at all times uh, for his first yeah. fourth down decision, yeah. fourth down decision making. I'm, I'm trying to actually get Sarah Bailey on the podcast because I know that she would love to talk about his fourth down decisions. Uh, she, she's I know, on that discussion. I know, I know um, you, you and Ben were discussing, and I think it was Ben that brought up the point about whatever the Rams do in terms of uh, health management. And I believe yeah. that's what Sarah Bailey works on in terms of like the sports science aspect over there, data collection and analysis on that front. Uh, whatever they're doing there is better than anybody else. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He had that as a pretty big input in his like rankings. I was surprised by how much it is because I guess I hadn't thought about it as much. Maybe I'm just not as again. This is one of these things from the outside where if I'm not as familiar with what they're doing on the inside, I'm gonna have a very large kind of uncertainty bar on whether it's just randomness or not for for things for things like 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 sports injury. Well, um, I, I think that's the area when we talk about like acceptance of using data. That's immediately accepted. How do we use data to lead to greater insight in terms of athlete usage, their health, uh, coaches, everybody, they jump right on board with that. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. never any dispute really on that sense. Maybe I'm exaggerating there, but it's really embraced at the beginning versus, hey, we're going to change how you make a decision in the game, right? You're going to get pushback from that. But if it's about, you know, this is a warning sign potentially, and hey, a player needs rest after this type of amount of movement, all right? They're going to jump on board for, hey, this. This is pretty insightful. We should keep investing in this space to lead to greater understanding for our players' health. Now, do you think that's and maybe, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of areas where the NFL is far ahead of media. Because I can think of, well, I remember for, there was a hard knocks back when the Browns were on hard knocks. And Hugh Jackson got into a little bit of a dispute with uh, Todd Haley and Freddie Kitchens. Um meeting of the minds there about whether or not I think it was Duke Johnson could sit out or not, or could he just wear his pads and the soft tissue injuries. And there's also things with the Browns with miles Garrett, where Garrett was getting veteran days off. It's, it's not like early because, you know, he was injured during his rookie season and he had had some injuries in college. And then even though he was only entering his second season, he was getting rookie days off. And there was a little bit of pushback about, about that, but you're saying that's something where the tradition of tough, practicing and not being soft i feel like at least in the nfl there might still be some pushback yeah um, no that's a good that's... point maybe about the, like uh, how it's involved at that scale um i do think in the sense of just like in game knowledge or even measuring say game to game you know what what do we believe like a level of fatigue about a player or how much they were their their usage in this game and you know, maybe how that impacts how they're used in a following game. Uh, maybe that's more of where it's uh, leading an impact. Um, you know, I mean, you see that in other sports, right? How basketball really embraced the resting of players. Uh, same same with baseball, where they're, they're like monitoring everything about them, right? How much they're sleeping, everything they're eating. Uh, and, it, you know, that becomes more of a an acceptable usage even if maybe there's ethical concerns about what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Plus, I mean, it, I think there's the dynamics of those sports with having these games that are... It's longer not, seasons, right? Not meaningless, but like a lot less. It's not like... Yeah. NFL, you're living and dying by by every single game, no matter what franchise that you are. But um, if until, you can gain understanding about within a game, about yes. say maybe not having someone run this type of route repeatedly or changing how they're used within the game to preserve them, whether it be some aging wide receiver who's kind of crazy but varies when he comes in or on the field or not, right? Um, like Antonio Brown, how he was used various times. Uh, you know, thinking about that usage uh, that you have direct data on now uh, with yeah. player tracking data. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about the player tracking data. So the what what work you've done with it we don't need to go into any you know proprietary information for for what you've done before but i guess i'm just interested from a larger level where i haven't worked with it that much we're talking about it's a whole different ball game from trying to deal with play by play data or anything else not only in your ability to kind of translate into something meaningful but it's it's on a different level as far as the volume of the of the data that you're getting versus very small amounts that you can just you know click through on your grind through on your locally on your on your laptop sort of thing um where were you as far as when you when you started working with the tracking data how much had you thought about from kind of like, like a to z how to make it useful or were you functioning in as far as like already having it in some sort of translatable fashion and then trying to come up with some with modeling and insights and pre predictive uh, type of stuff off of it. So the goal right away, actually, like immediately what uh, our group at Carnegie Mellon focused on. So this was 
uh, Sam Ventura and other PhD students at the time, along with uh, Costas Pelicrinus at Pitt, um, we immediately were thinking about how do we take expected points when probability that's observed at the discrete play level and how do we do it in continuous time fashion? All right, so that was, there was seminal work by Dan Travone, Luke Bourne, et cetera, the, the crew that runs Zealous now. Uh, they did this stock ticker type evaluation of within basketball games, right? What's the value of the current moment as players are continuously moving on the court? And so as soon as there was the announcement, even of player tracking data uh, and how it was starting and back when it, teams only had access to their data, you know, Sam and I were having these conversations of, Okay, how do we do this at the continuous level? Say we get access to this data, what would we do? All right, uh, and then eventually the big data will happen. Instead of entering the competition, the group of us just decided to spend a long period of time figuring out what's the framework you need to arrive at with for a moment within the play, how do we get expected points? And so you can think of each step that happens in a play. All right, the, the moment of, okay, ball is snapped. Now, is it a running play or is the QB dropping back, right? If it's a running play, then all you need to do is somehow have a model saying, where will the player end up on the field, yeah. right? You, you know, have a model that just says, this is negative. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> negative EPA immediately assigned to it. But, you know, you know, that's all you need for expected points when probability, right, is the ending yard line. You don't even need right. to get into like, oh, 2D, where exactly they're going to be on the field. You just need what's the ending yard line. All right. So that's great for running plays. Bam. That's all you need, essentially, uh, which that's a hard model. But for dropbacks. All right. Now there's a, a bunch of other steps that have to happen. Right. Now you have to think about what's going to be the QB decision. Are they going to throw it away? Are they going to get hit? Or are they going to attempt to pass to somebody? Uh, all right, given that they attempted the pass, who are they throwing to? Given that they're throwing to this person, is it going to be complete or not? All right, and those are all models, right? And it all builds up and adds to this complexity of how we approach this problem uh, that ultimately, if you think about it, it's a shit ton of work. <laughs> it's a lot of models. That's a technical, that the technical term for it. Yeah, yes. That no. you have to be careful how you put them together to try to arrive at this sort of stock ticker of within a play, what's going on. And why do we care about that? It's because we want to understand what actions matter within a football play. Because on the play to play level, you're just completely discounting how players are directly involved. Right. And maybe some players who are on the opposite side of the field of the action, they're not really doing anything. They don't really matter for that specific play. So if I care about dividing the credit about the, the 10 yard gain and this change in expected points value, you know, I want to look at, OK, which players contributed to that. And at the discrete play level, we don't know that that answer. Uh, so like we then when we first got access to this, because there's a lot going on with modeling quarterback decision making and passing plays, we just went straight to, all right, let's model a uh, ball carrier uh, <laughs> end of yard line, because at the end of the day, you need that for any real situation. Uh, so we're just going to go straight to the running plays to make it easier for ourselves, because the whole framework requires a lot of people collectively working together for probably a year or two years to get something working that you're comfortable with, all right? And that's even just arriving at an estimate of continuous time value. It doesn't even tell you who matters or not, right? That takes a whole other step of trying to figure out how do we parse this stock ticker that goes from snap to the end of the play and how the value is changing, right? If I wanna figure out then which players really do matter, I have to figure out what approach divvies up this change in the stock value of a play. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think there's so many interesting applications of that type of analysis. At the same time, there are many opportunities for someone to be like, well, that's, you know, you can't say, I'm trying, let me think of something here. So let's, let's talk about a running play. So it'll be a little bit, a little bit easier. So if you have point in time, expected points added, 
at any particular time, let's say at, at handoff to the running back, you're going to have an idea of how well the scheme wise, maybe the blocking versus the defense is on some sort of level. Maybe you can have an idea of running back. If you try to figure out like running back decision making as far as where they're they're picking which hole they're picking to go into. Maybe you could try to work towards that. Maybe you could go, you know, how well certain teams can get on or off. Certain players can get in or off of blocks or can hold their blocks. But for a lot of this stuff, like, man, I could just see players and others being like, well, you don't like, you don't understand, you know, (laughs) what's going on on this, on this sort of play before you can actually get to the level of trying to, to, to do something in a different way. So what, what I'm wondering is, and maybe you've done this, because what I, what I would maybe approach some of this stuff is, is like, can, can you even more than just diagnose a particular play? Can you like find very, very similar plays and then see when different decisions are being made? It's, it's almost kind of like simulating what's going on in some sort of way and then try to get some insight off it. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud on, on how, it, how, how you translate having this, even if it's exactly precise knowledge of player positioning, coordinates, momentum, everything on the field, having the precise expected points added, how you translate into something that's going to help you win football games. Yeah, no, that's absolutely great points. Um, because so that's that gets at like, okay, why are we actually even doing this in the first yes. place, right? To come up with this fancy continuous time value of what's going on within plays. Uh, and so like the approach I like to think about that we sort of attempted uh, when I say we uh, Costas, Pellegrinus and myself and the one year's big datable sample uh, where what we were doing was, OK, let's say we have some valuation of what's going on within a play. What if we model for each player, you know, where given their the rest of the, the team where they're at uh, and we have our history of player tracking data albeit limited, uh, where would we expect to see somebody? All right, like if you're thinking about uh, after once once a, a catch is made and you're trying to figure out uh, what value the cornerback had, uh, where they were positioned at the moment of catch versus, say, maybe where the average corner would have been given the positions of everybody else on the field and other knowledge you have about the play. And does that tell you what that change then in thinking of what the value of the play is at that precise moment, given this corner's position versus where the average corner's position is? And then maybe we can think about like accrediting to that corner. This is the value added from where they were at. Right. Uh, and so th- another aspect of this that makes this really hard uh, for all of like these models for player tracking data, you could think of like the, the popular example being um, uh, with running backs, like modeling, okay, expected yards at handoff, right? There, that's that's become from the big data bowl a few years ago when the the Kaggle uh, uh, competitors that dominate Kaggle yeah, all the yeah. time. that was that, that was that that was what they were asked to do essentially. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that, but that's been like that's been popularly used right like lopez yes. always tweets out these updates about that of where okay you know uh, yards gained over expected a handoff right things like that uh and thinking about okay yes there was some expectation at that moment of handoff and then they gained beyond whatever um but you know okay versus if you change that running back with somebody else and the differences in the speed that those players inherently have, right? How much value is just the, sheer, the the speed difference from this running back versus another running back? Because all of these models account for speed in some way, the orientation of the players' movements. And all of those things are inherently functions of those players, which really makes this a hard problem to figure out how do we then separate like what value an individual player is contributing. because they're the player with that speed. So we have to think about, as you said, almost some type of simulation sort of approach, right? If we plug in the average running back in this situation and they don't reach this top speed, they can only accelerate at this rate. They can only uh, break or turn at whatever sort of angle, et cetera. What would happen in the play, right? How would that change then this stock ticker value that we've seen? 
with the actual running back that we have, who we know has some speed of whatever level, and we know has some ability to turn, et cetera. And then we can see, okay, the differences between the observed running back all right, versus our fake one of some kind. Now that gives us a sense of how good this observed running back actually is. All right. And so like that, that simulation type idea, or we call like ghosting of some kind of having this ghost player to compare to, uh, that to me is how you end up using uh, these, these types of values that we have of continuous time expected points when probability uh, with some form of ghosting simulation to then get at player value accreditation. Uh, to figure out how much they were actually providing. Like, that's a really hard thing to do, though, right? Yeah, I could, yeah. I could talk about it at a really high level and like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. But that takes a long time to figure out what's the actual right way to do it. What are, What's the way that's not going to be problematic from uh, the different models you have or uh, how correlated each of these things are? Uh, you have to be careful in sort of constructing this problem. And it's not surprising then if you think about it as to why that's really hard for a single NFL team to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, have... I'm thinking about like, okay, so it's trying to attribute it to a particular player. I guess this, is what I would think would be like a push and push and pull here is that I remember, and I, I don't want to like, I'm not trying to d- disparage the numbers that you see in like next gen stats for these different running backs but you like they use this model that you're talking about. I've seen it published. I haven't looked through it extensively, so I I don't I'm just things that came to mind when I looked at it. Where they'd have it assigned to the individual running back, how much they're getting above or below expectation based upon at handoff. And I would look through there and I'm like, hmm. Like every year, these Baltimore Ravens running backs seem to be pretty good, <laughs> pretty good at, at what they're doing here. So maybe like there's maybe it's not them as much. Maybe yeah. there's something that's not being captured. In the model, so that would that would allow you to say, yeah, if you could like ghost, like you're saying, a different player in there, maybe you get some more individual. And the insight. moment a handoff, if you think about it, might yeah. be just a little too arbitrary of a cutoff point. True. Maybe True. You yeah. know, blocks are not even settled in for an additional what like half second after the moment of handoff, anyway, right? Uh, you know, whatever the situation is, where okay, this is the design point of the run essentially, versus, oh, just the moment of handoff. And there's a lot that can change in fractions of second from handoff to the next step the running back takes, right? For yeah. how, you know, the linemen are positioned or whatever. Uh, and that itself could then be a where all the value was actually added. Right? The yeah, hole yeah, then was yeah. created in the next half second. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to get an idea. It comes, it's the same thing with traditional stats where you're trying to figure out that, you know, I can't tell you that player X is necessarily better than player Y, but I can tell you that when we looked at these thousand players that these types of traits embodied in subset A seem to perform better than in subset B. We can't necessarily tell you why. So maybe if you're looking for a player, you should look for someone who would fall into subset A. Is is, is a similar sort of thing happening with this tracking data? Or do you think you really can specifically get into the player level, because again, like you're saying, then you're thinking about what decisions are they making? How are they moving in some sort of way that's a little bit fuzzier? And then you're trusting what it's telling you a little bit more than you're saying, well, we know that running backs with who are fast or good, and this running back is fast. So therefore I should lean towards him more than I would otherwise. Yeah. I think it, I kind of lean towards like the idea of like the traits or like yeah. the class of the players myself. Um, but right now, I I don't think there's there there is still so much work to be done on understanding any of these outputs and results people are getting from the player tracking data, whether it be like the next gen stats crew, um, you know, th- there's just th- this is just like a tease of what's going on essentially. All right, people are diving in with some initial modeling attempts, and there's even dispute. Like I, I remember when Next Gen Stats did like their completion probability model, and then it was like they're talking about it as like a QB decision framework, even though then it was using information upon the ball's r- arrival, which then that has nothing to do with the QB decision because the ball's already arrived. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, so like, I I think it's still just like scratching the surface, uh, so. 
my the conclusions that are drawn right now from analysis with player tracking data are still pretty limited of what you see publicly. Like even thinking of like rushing yards over expected. Uh, if a running back is only ever used in a goal line situation, they're never going to have many yards to gain. On a per carry basis, right? Yeah, yeah. it's truncated. All right. Yeah. The running backs yeah. that are used in the middle of the field, oh yeah, they could really potentially gain a lot more. So then, right, that you, you pop off like, one seventy-yard run or something like that, and that skews the stats. Yeah, yeah. Where they're used that on the field, what the distribution of what the outcome could be, right, heavily affects that statistic. Uh, and I remember like Benny Snell was always someone, it was a Steelers running back. who was like, Oh yeah, his rushing yards over expectation was terrible, but it was like, he was always brought in in these short down situations where it was obvious. The guy was never going to break off a big run. Cause he's just like diving in a third and one or whatever. Right. So yeah. how should I penalize the player for the situation in, w- in which they are being used? I don't think I should. Right. And it's the same thing we think about with like running backs don't matter concept of, hey, yes, we know running the ball is not as valuable as passing. So then when we look at once the running back gets the football and the expected point situation is negative already, potentially. Right. But then they are able to do whatever action that beats what the average running back would do. That's a sign that, hey, that player's pretty good at that rule still. Right. Even if maybe they're used in a way that is not going to benefit the team, then maybe you can move them into a role that would benefit the team in some capacity more so. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't yeah. Hate no, the I think hate that they're used. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I could just take a step back here a sec. Cause I think like if you were, if we were looking at this, that, galaxy brain like meme maybe we're talking a little bit more about like the sparkle super galaxy brain sort of stuff and what could be done with tracking data like how much and again we don't have to get into the the details of exactly what the work is being done on the outside but i feel like teams though when they're even when they're consulting with someone they might want maybe a couple of earlier categories are a can you take this tracking data and just replace like man hours that we're putting in for some dude looking at tape and grinding out whatever and make that so much more efficient where we we need to do spot checks or maybe on things like that, but not grind in that sort sort of way. B, can we do something that could conceivably be done with man hours, but it just was like so ridiculous that we didn't want to put the man hours into it. Like those two buckets. And then maybe C is what we're talking about where you're really getting these insights and further away. Like how much of those first two buckets, how important is that for, for teams? And is that kind of where we are now with how it's being used? So those first two buckets, you're absolutely right. Like that's immediate acceptance and usage of thinking about like how to automatically tag things of some kind. Uh, and there's what, various companies that are like doing this, whether it be like identifying routes from uh, effectively the tracking data and the film, you know, to ease the process of how much film would have to be watched to identify different things. And if you could automatically identify it, right, then bam, those man hours are gone, right, to, yeah. to do that process. And so, yeah, you absolutely see that already taking place, whether it be some service that companies are, you know, the, the teams are paying some company to perform, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, things like what, like telemetry or, uh, you know, that provide like different interfaces for teams to access, uh, summarizing uh, uh, games and not going into like the research level, right? Because the research level, that, that part C, right, of what you said. That's mm-hmm. still the what questions should we even try to answer or ask with the player tracking data, right? And in the research world, there is no guidance. <laughs> you don't really, <laughs> you know, no one's telling you exactly to do. It's it's a lot of tinkering and it, it takes a, a lot of time, right? And so that's why you're absolutely right. Like in terms of like investment in immediate outcome takeaway, it's far easier in our short attention span world of just, hey, yeah, let's let's get the thing that immediately tags these different labels for us in an automated fashion. And bam, yeah, we have instant return on what we paid for versus thinking about a long term sort of commitment to we need people to try to figure out what is going on with 
the complex data that we now have access to, knowing that we're not going to see an answer the next day, maybe even the next five months, right? And th th that, I think, is this interesting balance of, you know, baseball teams definitely have now, you know, it's almost like mini companies, mini tech companies, like what you see with the Dodgers, what you see with the Astros, a whole workforce of people, whether it be, yes, there's day-to-day -day tasks, but then there's also research tasks that they're working on and collaborating on. Uh, and NFL teams are nowhere near that level yet, right? Maybe you could say like, Okay, the commitment like someone like uh, Cleveland has a lot of people there, right? And maybe they have the ability to have some people say dedicated to more like research type role. Uh, but other teams, it's just one or two people that they are the, you know, the analytics staff that have to work on the day to day. They have to get the things for the coach. They have to get the things for the, the GM. You know, they, they don't have time to then sit there and try to figure out uh, what the hell do we do with this player tracking data? How do we model different steps of a QB decision-making process? How, what does that even mean once we have the different steps for the QB decision-making process? You know, how then can we use that to get greater understanding of evaluating quarterbacks? How does that carry over to them when we're looking at college level, right? When we fundamentally care about projecting uh, these different types of performances. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely like the immediate, uh, you know, profit in some sense of what you can do with sort of the automatic detection, the labeling that hopefully then takes a workload off. Uh, and the, that other part of the research part is a lot more harder to commit to, right? Because it's, it's just going to take a lot more time, right? The payoff is not going to be right away. But, you know, once player tracking data uh, is you know is readily available at the college football level, whichever team are properly using that to get a better understanding of all, you know, assessing all the positions that we have access to now in terms of evaluating uh, with player tracking data, which you can't do at the play-by-play -play level, right? Yeah, you can get a pretty good idea of with quarterbacks in a limited sense still, right? With great uncertainty, but you can't really say anything about other players in college football with play-by-play -play data. You have to rely on, say, evaluations of a lot of hours from, you know, the folks at PFF grading everything, right? To then be able to project forward. But once you get this windfall of what comes in uh, with player tracking data at the college level, who's ever going to be able to use that in a proper fashion is going to benefit immediately beyond everybody else, right? To start with, you know that that will create that could create a gap depending on how uh, you know teams vary in how much they're committed to understanding uh, player tracking data. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I, I wonder a little bit for the NFL whether like teams are going to have that sort of commitment. I mean, you mentioned these like many. Uh, enterprises within baseball teams to do this. I find it that on the NFL side, I guess I just don't know if that's going to happen, but at the same time, teams like to be very proprietary about all they do. So working with an outside company at the same point in time, maybe that isn't attractive to them also, which kind of just delays the process at all for certain teams probably to, to work with it. Yeah. I, I do think it will eventually happen that, teams it will almost become like the model of what you see in the other sports um it's just not there yet and and maybe it'll just take the first story of the team that really did commit to using uh you know investing in this research side of what you can do with the data instead of just relying on every year the big data bowl comes out and then oh let's hire that person that did this <laughs> did this thing uh you know had this cool submission um, but then only have them working on like day-to-day -day task and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And not knowing how to use them. Well, I guess it's a step up from we're going to hire uh, whatever Ivy league undergraduate uh, c comes in. Cause we don't know. Yeah. We don't know any better anyway. I mean, the thing that's still true is we're still really early in this process with player tracking data with the NFL, right? Um, yeah. Like baseball pitch FX, that was like 2008. I right? like baseball obviously started way before, with the investment in analytics, but like the the different types of data 
uh, you know, the new data we have from technology and whatnot, right? Didn't evolve until, okay, 2008 was pitch FX, getting all the pitch level information. And then, and then you started to see this influx of people that worked on that entering teams. And then 2014 was MLB StackCast. And again, a lot more data coming in. And then teams stepped up again. You know, football, we've had play-by-play data for an extended period of time. And then annotations added to that from various sources, right? And then it's only, what, 2017 was when NFL tracking data started. And even at the beginning, teams only had access to their own data, which was pretty much useless other than monitoring, like, player usage and for, you know, injury sort of analysis, potentially, Uh but, you know, it, we're still in this early stage that, I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that 10 years from now you have a couple teams that almost resemble what you have in baseball, potentially. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you're yeah. just going to have to commit to it. once you, Especially once college football has readily available player tracking data for teams to access. Uh, it, it, that will be the biggest, you know, challenge for teams to catch up with who is who is able to use that data for projecting players. Okay, well, this, this leads into, this has been a great discussion, Ron, by the way, but I have a couple of final questions that that one leads directly into one of them. So if you were going to use your, your crystal ball here and look in, let's say, five to ten years out, um, looking specifically at the NFL, where which area do you think – is going to be the most affected by the tracking data and the use of tracking data. Do you think it's going to be, and these are, these would be your choices. You can, you could come up with another one if I don't get this right, but on field decisions, you know, the health and injury prevention, which we kind of talked about has already been used quite a bit now Um, scouting other NFL players. So pro scouting, college scouting, or, you know, even within the pro scouting, kind of knowing your own players better and being able to make, better contract decisions, which is kind of part of pro scouting. So maybe I won't see it necessarily as separately, but being able to value those players in, in a certain way, and maybe even using analytics to think about structuring, you know, your team and the salary cap and all of that sort of stuff, which is a little bit different than the on-field valuation of what's going on. So I, I think it's in the, the scouting sense of like, okay, evaluating player performance at this level, projecting player performance at the next level, I, I think that's where the impact is going to be in the in these next five years. All right, of how do we use the player tracking data to properly then assess how players are performing, whether it be like how they're able to turn, how they're how fast they can you know how you know how they can accelerate, et cetera. What what meaning does that have for their role uh, with the team? That that's where I think it will be the biggest advantage and. Being able then to do that going from college to the NFL. Um, I On field decision making, I find that would be really hard to like, like what you can do with player tracking data and evaluating, okay, yeah, this cut, like you're not going to tell a player, like, oh, yeah, you need to make that cut all the time because that was the one that really worked. That, that's ridiculous, yeah. right? But yeah. that gives you a sense of, hey, they were able to do that within the play. Right. And that's because they have some inheritability that enables them to make that type of cut or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, And they're they're able to read uh, the play action play better than other players. And so they have some inherent skill in that sense. So understanding that uh, from this valuation point of view and, you know, I the salary cap space, that's way over my head. I have never gotten into that. Uh, But connecting it. Right will again be another hurdle of what's the dollar value from the impact that they have on the field. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's funny. The, the on-field stuff, I feel like there could be an area there, but it would be pretty hard to get buy-in if you're saying, Hey coach, have you ever thought about, you know, maybe you should have your progressions do this versus doing that. You're probably, probably not getting like a yeah. lot of, a lot of buy-in yeah. in that, in that sort of area. But for the college scouting, Is there an issue of not having the data going back, though, there? Or because it's so granular, do you not need the historical? So it's definitely an issue, right? It's going to take some years to, in my opinion, to be able to do this. Maybe you could figure out, someone clever could figure out how to say model something that's like what we have from PFF versus what we can collect uh, with 
uh, tracking data and maybe have a model sort of linking those things that helps you backfill uh, in prior years. Uh, someone will probably do that in some sense, um, and that could be useful. But I, I do think, yeah, it, you're absolutely right. Like, it's not going to be, oh, just after one year, now we know everything there is to know about modeling uh, college football player tracking data, and we can immediately exploit it. It's going to take a while, but there are services that are coming about. I know StatsBomb is now entering this space of let's use video. You know, you know, NFL player tracking data is from the chips and shoulder pad and the ball. It's almost like a gold standard in the way of what, what's getting collected uh, versus using video feed and our fancy neural net technology, et cetera, to extract player locations on the field, turn that into data points, right? Using parsing those video and that can go that can go back in time pretty far right uh you know it's a lot of work um but that could be really useful for building a rich hist historical data set that these teams will be able to exploit and you know teams themselves the nfl teams themselves are technically able to do this as well right of extracting data points from previous historical film you're going to be limited in what you have but it's better than nothing yeah, yeah. And if, if we can also figure out a way to um, make draft Twitter obsolete, we have to we have to focus on that. I, I gotta be honest, I don't mind it. I'm like thoroughly entertained <laughs> by it. No, yeah, I don't mind. I, I never like chime in or anything like that. I just I just like looking at it. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> and like seeing you know the the change in value uh, after the season ends. At, you know, after when, when players are no longer playing and the change in valuation of the players over over the time up until the draft to me is absolutely irrational and hysterical. But yeah, the uh, continuous time player valuations when they don't actually do anything. It's quite fascinating. That is quite fascinating. Yeah, that and then once they actually get in the NFL, how long people are willing to hold on or discard their their previous evaluations is always interesting on a player by player basis. OK, so last thing I have for you here. Um, I like to hate a lot here on this podcast, the hater friendly podcast. So what are you, what do you see out there in the world that you think that everyone kind of has wrong about maybe football analytics? It can be as broad or as, as narrow as, as you want to go, um, from, from your higher plane of knowledge, you can just think of yourself as being in a higher plane of knowledge than, than the rest of us out there grinding on these Twitter streets. What, what are you seeing that's wrong? So I'm going to say this without getting into any details as to why if you want to mention names you want to call out names go ahead but <laughs> and th this actually even goes to what i did the current approach for expected points uh is flawed oh my god we're our whole our whole right, analysis like, and there, careers are over there's flaws limitations to what what is currently being done and how it's used um and i I can't say why, given other discussions and internal stuff that have taken place. Um, but I, I do believe there are serious flaws with like the public expected points models uh, that are currently out there right now. Um, okay. I'm so that's not really a hot take, not a hater take in a way, because that's part of my yes. fault as well. Like what <laughs> I wrote a paper that, to do that. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of get annoyed with like the semantics, the discussions that kind of happen in, in football analytics. Like, tone? I, you don't like tone yeah, discussions? Well, I don't know. It, it, that, it goes back to like our previous discussion about like, you know, clashing with the media or whatever. I don't I just don't give a shit. I don't know. The um, I, I like I'm more interested in the moving forward. What can we learn with new data sources? Um instead of kind of harping on the same points over and over again, you know, sometimes you just got to let it go and just, you don't need to talk to this person on Twitter who doesn't believe you because they're never going to believe you. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can't it, convince it's, everybody. So my, my take with the, the, the tone thing is that I don't think like football analytics people or sports analytics people are any better or worse than any other group when it comes to to Twitter. I do think people's reactions to the tone is different. Like they're more, it, it, you know, if if Steve Smith uh, comes on and has some tone about something, that's just going to play differently than if, you know, John 
LGBTQ nerd has some tone about something and, you know, whatever. We just have to accept the fact that's the way that's the way it goes. I don't think there's necessarily any better or worse tone. It's all bad, basically, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> all right. Well, I try to stay out of the tone stuff. You do, I think, a great, great job of that, too, Ron. So, again, follow Ron at stat underscore Ron. Anything else you want to you wanna plug before getting out of here? I just have to say this has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could go a lot longer. Maybe I'll bug you about coming on sometime in the future to keep going. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always love listening to the podcast. I'm amazed you're able to do this by yourself. It kind of like blows my <laughs> mind, to be frank with you. Um, but yeah, people could check out our open source sports podcast. Myself, Costas Pelicrinus. And then also you can stay tuned for information uh, about Carnegie Mellon Sports Analytics Conference that takes place every year. It should be back in person. Uh, This year, hopefully sometime early November. So I'll probably be tweeting out info about that in the coming weeks ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys are doing an awesome job there. And as you mentioned, the names you've been mentioning out, uh, better than the Belichick tree, I would say. The the CMU (laughs) tree that's been going out there has been much has been has been much more successful out in out in the real world. And and we all appreciate it on the outside. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Ron. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'll be coming back at you next week. I'm going to talk to one of uh, Ron's favorites, Josh Hermsmeyer, next week. We're going to we're going to put out our cancelable NFL take. So we get canceled by uh, football guys and media Twitter on that. But until then, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And I'll talk to you then.